Aotearoa, New Zealand, a nation of mountains, temperate rainforest, wetlands, grasslands, and a beautiful coastline. Everywhere you look in this country, birds have replaced roles that are filled by mammals and reptiles in many other locations, and today we're going to explore why New Zealand, as well as other regions around the globe, have developed such unique ecosystems. The only native mammals on land here in Aotearoa are those that could cross the oceans. Today, this is limited to two species of bat, both of which are small, and a few species of pinnipeds, some of whom are actually the size of a small car. The rest of the native ecosystem is dominated by birds. There are two concepts at work here that allow one group of animals to become dominant, notably when that group hasn't been the dominant group in many regions for millions of years. The first is called isolated evolution. This concept is pretty self-explanatory. The animals here evolved in isolation of other populations. New Zealand split from all other land masses around 80 million years ago, during the late Cretaceous period. This was before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, and it definitely wasn't the same shape it is today. There is still debate going on around exactly when the major expansion of mammals and their relatives began, but at this point in time, the mammal lineage was far less diverse than it is today, so New Zealand would have had very few of them when this split occurred, if any. It's this isolation that leads to different pressures being put on the species here, in a kind of cascade feedback loop. Let me show you how this works. We begin when a new pressure to adapt is introduced from other members of the ecosystem or perhaps from the environment around them. As an example, let's imagine most of the ground-dwelling predators in an ecosystem go extinct, and the majority of predators that remain can fly now. Then, the individuals of other species that successfully adapt to this new environment will have an advantage and they will become the dominant individuals in that species. As an example, let's say the animal begins to spend more time on the ground at night to avoid these flying predators. This new species will, in turn, affect the environment around them, and more species will have to adapt to this animal that spends more time on the ground at night, including the first species we were talking about, which then leads to more and more and more, creating a constant state of change. When this ecosystem of constant change like this is separated from the larger ecosystems, the adaptations that succeed here can begin to spiral further and further away from their original forms. As one species develops a unique solution to a pressure placed on them, the other species must adapt to a unique solution and therefore a unique pressure that doesn't exist quite the same in the larger ecosystems. This may then create more unique solutions to those unique pressures, which can create this spiral that leads to more unique species. There are probably fewer better examples to help me explain this than the island of Madagascar. Around 90% of the animal species that exist on Madagascar exist only on Madagascar or on the Comoro Islands. This large island is not very far from the African continent, with the shortest distance being only 400 kilometers away. And while Madagascar split from Africa slightly earlier than New Zealand split from the ancient continent of Gondwana, it remained near Africa, about three times closer than New Zealand is to Australia at their nearest points. This may be a contributing reason why Madagascar has native land mammals, and New Zealand practically doesn't. The top predator on Madagascar is the fossa, and part of a group of predators called Euplorids, which exist only in Madagascar, and are most closely related to the mongoose, which are not even close to top predators anywhere else in the world. On the menu for fossa are birds, such as the ground rollers, which are related to kingfishers but exist only on Madagascar. Also on the menu are reptiles like the panther chameleon, that exists only on Madagascar. But mostly, 
Fossa hunt the famous lemurs, a group of more than 100 different species, all of which live, and say it with me now, only on Madagascar. This unique ecosystem is full of species that look similar to their continental counterparts, but they have adapted to the unique environments and the pressures placed on them by the adaptations of others. But Madagascar and Aotearoa New Zealand are far from the only cases of isolated evolution. Australia is known for its hardcore wildlife. It doesn't seem to actually be more dangerous than any other area in the world. In fact, the lack of large mammalian carnivores might make it slightly safer in terms of wildlife than Asia or Africa, but I digress because we're actually talking about the mammals that they do have. Monotremes and marsupials are alternative classes of mammals from the more common placental mammals. They are distinct in the ways that they have adapted to give birth, where placental mammals give birth to mostly developed young, marsupials give birth very early in development, and the young will continue to develop while attached to their mother externally, often in something like a pouch. Then there are the monotremes, which are mammals that lay eggs. It's thought that monotremes first evolved in Australia, while marsupials made their way to Australia from South America via Antarctica, before those three continents separated from each other. The isolation of Australia then allowed marsupials to not just continue surviving, but to thrive. Speaking of prehistoric South America, this continent had some weird looking animals before it collided with North America. This is an event known as the Great American Interchange. Most of the stranger animals have gone extinct, but their evolution was relatively in isolation from the rest of the world, leading to a few interesting shapes. Nailing down to extreme cases, Locations like the Tepui Mountains that sit along the bordering regions of Venezuela, Guyana, and Brazil have unique ecosystems living on top of them in isolation from the rest of the rainforest. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's novel and subsequent classic film, The Lost World, was about exploring one of these Tepui, but as far as we know, the only dinosaurs on top of these mountains are birds. These are all examples of that cascade feedback loop we talked about earlier, something in the environment changes, forcing other species to adapt. This same concept applies to New Zealand. One reason that flight is an advantage to bug-eating animals in particular is that they can quickly dart down to the ground, collect food, and then get away before any potential ground-based predators arrive. But, when the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct and no mammals diversified to fill the hole, there was a lack of these ground-based predators in New Zealand. This meant that the pressure placed on some birds to retain their ability to fly was reduced. Probably most famously, the kiwi's diet is based on bugs in the ground, so spending more time on the ground meant that they could eat more, and use less energy than flying. This eventually led them to lose the ability to fly altogether. And this leads us to talking about another effect that can occur in cases of isolated evolution, but also separately from it. Adaptive radiation. In the Americas, Asia, Africa, and Europe, there are ground-dwelling bug-eating animals like hedgehogs, rodents, or moles. In Australia, you'll find the echidna, which are monotremes, so quite unrelated to the others, but nonetheless is still a mammal with a similar-ish body plan. In New Zealand, you'll find bug-eating animals like the kiwi and the tuatara. You'll notice that these two species are quite differently shaped to the others on this list. We just talked about how the absence of ground-dwelling predators in New Zealand led to kiwi evolving to be flightless, but it also allowed the persistence of this unique reptile. The tuatara is the last remaining sphenodont, a group that arose in the same age as the dinosaurs. The tuatara, as well as the kiwi, fit into a role in New Zealand ecosystems. We call these roles niches, 
or niches if you're American. The niche for these two can be as vague as just insectivore, which means an animal that eats insects. Or the niche could get more specific. We could say burrowing nocturnal insectivore. You'll recognize that this niche applies to all of the animals that we just explored. Well, would you look at that. It's time for today's game. Today's game is all about guessing animals and niches. You have here in front of you five niches, each represented by an example species from North America that could fit these roles. Below them are five animals from New Zealand. Can you tell me which of these animals from New Zealand fits into these niches? Was this your answer? Ecological niches, as with many tools of categorization, aren't set in stone. Think of it as being less like comparing elements on the periodic table and more like comparing music genres, where every animal is David Bowie. Each species has a unique set of behaviors, diets, and habitat ranges, so these animals can only loosely be compared to each other, but looking at these, you can tell that many of these niches that are generally taken up by mammals are taken up by birds in New Zealand. This is an effect that we call adaptive radiation. Radiation isn't just energy emitted from unstable rocks, it's also the ecological term for when one group quickly adapts to exploit available or even vacant niches. Adaptive radiation is usually started with one single species, but in essence we can apply the same logic to a larger group, such as birds in general. This effect typically happens when a species is introduced to a new area but tends to happen on an even larger scale after a mass extinction. You know, like an asteroid colliding with the Earth and wiping out all non-avian dinosaurs. Then, in the absence of any mammals or those non-avian dinosaurs in New Zealand, these niches were open for the avian dinosaurs, or birds, to step up to the plate. There are a few exceptions, such as the tuatara, which we spoke about earlier, and weta, Insects whose ecological role could perhaps be compared to some rodents or other small mammals overseas. And if you'd like to know more about them, we actually have an entire species spotlight on them. Birds radiated into most of the empty niches, leaving New Zealand as one of the last land masses on Earth where dinosaurs remained the dominant clade. I say remained because unfortunately New Zealand does contain a lot of mammals today. Whether they were introduced by humans on purpose, introduced by humans accidentally, or actually are humans, the mammals in this country wreak havoc on the local bird populations. So basically everyone in New Zealand knows how special our bird life is, to the point where we actually hold an annual Bird of the Year competition to vote for the best bird, which includes limited edition shoes inspired by the winners, has encountered uh, voting fraud, and this highly controversial decision to allow a bat to win one year that truly divided the nation. This competition is run by a non-profit called Forest and Bird, and if you'd like to donate, you can find a link in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ben, the Quasi-Ecologist, and this is The Natural World Explored. Until next time, stay curious, friends. This bird right here, the Kedaru, has hit me in the face not once but twice so think about that next time you're you're planning a trip to safe old little new zealand <laughs> <laughs>